This paper is divided into three sections. Firstly, an, historic, an, an historiographical perspective to summarize the way urban architecture developed in France in the 70s. Secondly, I shall present the diversity of approaches from historical topography to dynamic modeling. And finally, I shall tackle a selection of current issues in urban archaeology. So my first point. Um, so for, for many years, uh, as I swear, in Europe, uh, French towns were regarded by archaeologists as uh, research places in which they could select a category of sites to study with a strong interest for antiquity and a limited one for the Middle Ages except for the most remarkable monuments such as cathedrals or castles or city walls, which were mainly studied by art historians. In other words, for many years, towns were places where research was carried out, but they were not the main target of this research, which was dealing mainly with public building and Roman urbanism. In the 60s, things started to change, firstly in England, where the first research program in urban archaeology was developed by Martin Biddle in, the, in Winchester, dealing with major buildings such as the early medieval cathedral or the bishop's palace, but also with street pattern, domestic architecture and funerary areas, studying the long-term transformation of the urban space between the late Iron Age and the modern times. It was the main purpose of this program, which was based on large-scale excavations as well as on numerous written sources. The impact of this research program was huge both in England and on the continent, as many European archaeologists were trained in Winchester, learning how to dig large open areas with a very precise stratigraphic approach formalized by the Aris metric, which my colleague already mentioned. Such was the case of Henri Galinier, who started developing a similar program in Tours in 1969, followed by similar um, initiatives in Saint-Denis or Douai, for example. In those days, very little money was devoted to archaeology at the wool in France, and that changed very gradually after several huge scandals due to the demolition of major archaeological remains without any archaeology or very little of it. That was a time of rescue archaeology which led, as far as, as towns were concerned, to several actions decided by the state in the early 80s. Firstly, the, the first European Symposium in Urban Archaeology took place in Tours in 1980, confronting data from France, England, Germany, and the Netherlands. The National Center for Urban Archaeology was created in 1984 in Tours by the Ministry of Culture. It was designed both as a forum for methodological discussion and as a resource center for the scientific community. It organized roundtables on methodological issues, published the annual report of field operations in urban environment, and an annual bibliography of urban archaeology. It was also involved in the assessment of urban archaeological heritage, which I shall present later on. Urban archaeology played an important part in the development of rescue archaeology in France in the 80s and 90s, during which archaeological units of different status were gradually created in a large number of towns. Uh, I'm lost. <laughs> um, in a large number of towns, sorry. Later on, some of these units were suppressed when a national institution was put up by the state in 1973, Association pour les Fouilles Archaeologiques Nationales, which was replaced in 2001 by the National Institute of Research in Preventive Archaeology in HAP, which employs over 2,000 people. Finally, since 2003, private companies have also been developed, which means that some towns may be excavated by the same team for many years, such as Aix-en-Provence, for instance. There is a very important um, uh, municipal archaeological unit there. But some other towns may be excavated by several teams which do not necessarily connect with each other. This competitive system is particularly bad for urban archaeology, which requires continuity to be able to understand the transformation process in the long term. Otherwise, archaeology is only regarded as, as one compulsory stage in the building project. My second point on um, uh, historical topography to dynamic modeling. 
The development of urban archaeology in Northwest Europe based on English practice led to the publication of books which took stock of topographical knowledge from antiquity to the modern period and assessed the state of preservation of the subsoil. Their main purpose was to detect the least known periods and to assess the capacity of uh, archaeology to provide answers to the questions raised. Once again, it started in England with the famous book, The Future of London Past, published in 1973 by Martin Biddle and another two colleagues, and which revealed how little was known about London in the early Middle Ages, during which the so-called Dark Ages. I shall come back to that point uh, later on. This, this book acted um, as a model for Les Archives du Sol à Tours, published in 1979 by Henri Galinier and Bernard Randouin, which served itself as a model for a collection of documents assessing the archaeological heritage of French towns published by the National Center of Urban Archaeology. 22 of them came out between 1990 and 2012. To be able to study topographical objects, two levels of description of archaeological features were identified and used in these documents usage values and uh, used as a, as a site or district level and urban values used as a town level. It makes it easier to compare various elements of urban space and to reconstruct um, <laughs> sorry uh, and, to, uh, and to reconstruct maps at various periods show them accordingly to the historical development of each town. Well, example of such maps uh, for tour. The superposition of all archaeological phases provides an overview of the historical urban space in the long term. The other purpose of such documents was to assess the depth and quality of archaeological deposit within the historical limits of towns. This assessment also uh, helps to define, uh, allows to define areas in which preventive archaeology should, should be undertaken if a development was to take place. Geographical Information System, GIS, was introduced in archaeology at the very end of the 1980s and its use became widespread in the mid-1990s. GIS made a considerable contribution to urban archaeology, first by providing management tools for storing, manipulating, processing and posting data, and secondly by changing completely the way that information is analyzed and interpreted. GIS is now developed for most historic towns, both within the framework of preventive archaeology and for research purposes. It is now acknowledged that the rational use of GIS applications to process archaeological data enables, or rather imposes, better organization of information systems and can allow new issues to be tackled. In tour, a GIS was set up in 1996, primarily as a research tool. It's named Totopi for Topographie de Tour Pré-Industriel, is a documentary system with four interacting levels, as shown on the slide. The sources, the documentary systems that transform the sources into references once they have been critically assessed. Third level, comparison of the sources to identify the historical objects. And finally, the historical object that has been located and defined at the robust spatial unit is entered into the GIS. Four lines of research can be tackled through the use of this GIS, either at site level or at town level. Firstly, processing and interpreting uh, archaeological field data using a process ranging from recording excavation data to their analysis in the laboratory. Secondly, historical topography organized around a database with, with thematic and chronological input at the town level. Urban morphology through statically, statistically processing the orientations of the plot boundaries in the 19th century, uh, as seen here, it revealed in two or three major orientations, and, for, and fourthly, assessment of the archaeological potential by modeling the urban soil at the town level. 
as shown on this slide, which shows the variation of thickness of the subsoil in, in Tours. And finally, I shall, um, I shall <laughs> tackle a couple of issues. So I would like uh, this issue regarding uh, urban archaeology. Uh, I've chosen a few of them, but there are obviously um, they could, there could be many more, uh, like uh, for instance the slow development of building archaeology in French towns for domestic architecture and as well as for major buildings. But for the time being, I shall briefly discuss three points: how to assess the urban soil without destroying it or only very little of it the difficulty of understanding early medieval towns and the accessibility of archival data and the lack of publication. Assessing and modeling archival potential is the main issue and should be a priority for archival teams working in towns. Nevertheless, it is quite difficult to do it within the framework of preventive archaeology. Bourges, for instance, provide a very good example of what could be done to improve the knowledge of the urban soil at a town level. In the last uh, few years, the Bourges, the Bourges Architectural Unit developed new data acquisition procedures by combining destructive and non-destructive assessment methods like geophysical or mechanical surveys or core sampling in poorly documented areas. One of the main methods we've been using is PANDA, it's a computer-assisted dynamic penetrometer device. This device works on the principle of measuring point resistance while hammering a steel road, as you can see on the bottom slide. The results of these surveys are presented in the form of a penetrogram, representing the compactness of layers at different depths. This new data regarding the subsoil are processed in the actual GIS of Bourges which has two different parts, the one for, to deal with historical topography and the other one to deal with uh, information regarding subsoil. The second uh, current issue I would like to tackle, which is very well known for, from, uh, for by, mo by all um, uh, medievalists in France and elsewhere in Europe, is the, the problem of the um, Unvisibility of um, of the early medieval town. A vast majority of towns in the Roman world experienced profound changes starting in the third century. The contraction of urban space marked by the abandoning of residential areas and other and also um, and other areas. The creation of new funerary spaces on the, on the site of these areas. The change use of public buildings such as amphitheaters turned into marketplaces or residential areas. A shift from building in stone to building in timber and earth, identified by postals or trenches. A new way of dealing with refuse by keeping it on site, buried in pits or spread on the ground, rather than taking it outside the town. Combined, all these changes in land use and way of life generated an archaeological deposit of dark earth is identified in most towns between the late Roman levels and the 10th, 11th centuries. This thick level is also the result of post-depositional process in the long term. Understanding dark earth formation process requires a microarchaeological study, which is very much time consuming, and therefore is not often carried out in preventive archaeology. As a result, a very small part of dark earth uncovered in towns is properly excavated. Because of dark earth deposits, it is very difficult to identify domestic features, such as timber buildings, as opposed to funerary areas and churches, which in towns are mainly built in stones in the early Middle Ages. In other words, it is much easier to identify the dead and, than the living between the 5th and the 9th, 10th centuries. On most sites, domestic occupation is only identified through rubbish pits or sometimes ovens. It is quite rare to identify plots like in Douai in the 9th, um, in the 9th and 10th centuries. And you have also an example of um, 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 timber buildings uh, in Canterbury as an example. 
Finally, I would like to mention the difficulty for French archaeologists to have access to recent archaeological information regarding towns since the closing of the National Center of Urban Archaeology in 2017. Databases of urban excavations and catalog of bibliographical references are not maintained any longer, and the national online repertoire of excavations, Archaeology de la France, which provides abstracts of um, urban of all our excavations um, all um, undertaken in France is very much behind. Unlike the United Kingdom, where a large number of monographs have been published on individual sites, most excavations in French towns are still unpublished. It seems now impossible to publish excavations carried out uh, several decades ago, like the very large excavation at Le Louvre. But even for more recent excavations, the cost of publication um, is, not being, is not included in the budget paid by the developers. Therefore, it is very difficult to go further than the report, which is not yet widely distributed, although now more and more um, of them are um, published online. So, to conclude, the last 50 years revealed the legal and institutional changes that have marked urban archaeology, and more generally French archaeology, which has developed over this period from amateurism, in the positive sense of the word, to professionalism. The transition from a more accessible topographical approach to a morphological approach and then to different forms of modeling requiring new tools, notably the development of GIS, is one that can be found in a large number of French towns and elsewhere in Europe and in the world. However, it is regrettable that there are very few stable schemes dedicated to the study of a single town and its surroundings and environment whose archaeological analysis is made possible by the rapid urban development of the main towns. It is now possible to have a better understanding of urban and peri-urban occupation from protohistory to the modern times, raising new challenges and also of networks of towns at a regional level in a given period, one as aspect which I didn't tackle. Thank you very much.